Welcome to Cornerstone. Thank you for joining us today. If you are here in person, please silence your cell phone and have a seat. For those online, sit back, relax, and join us for a meaningful day of worship. Before we begin, here are a few announcements and prayer requests. Please keep the following in your prayers. Bill, who has health concerns. Maurice II, who is having blood pressure issues. The Okai family on the death of Opal. The Pipes and McCoy families on the death of Roe. Tom and Yvonne and family on the death of Tom's sister, Judy. Terry's cousin, who is hospitalized with COVID. William and Lucas, who were both burned in an explosion this past weekend. Sherry's dentist, Dr. Place, who is undergoing chemo treatments for breast cancer. Dolores' brother, Bob, who starts radiation treatments for throat cancer this week. And Caleb, who has personal concerns. And please keep everyone else in your prayer that needs prayers that was not mentioned today. Hi, I'm Bev. My name's Dallas. Hi, I'm Karen Joe. Hi, my name is Arla. Hi, I'm Karen. My name is Sue. My name is Robin, and I'm with Cornerstone United Methodist Church. I belong to the Cover Girls. I joined the Cover Girl Quilters here at Cornerstone Methodist Church just about a month or a month and a half ago. The Cover Girls makes quilts for foster children, the elderly, and Camp David. Camp David is a camp for children whose parents are in prison. Oh, we do so much more than just quilting. We really enjoy talking to each other, sharing ideas. And we meet at uh, around 9 o'clock, and uh, we love to have everyone come and join us. We meet every Tuesday at 9 a.m. And I've always said to people, we have uh, expectations that you'll have a good time. And we would love anybody or anybody that would like to come and join. We would love to have you. Come on and join us. You can help us do this. And everyone's welcome. You don't need to know how to sew. We've got great teachers here. We are actually the hands and feet of God, showing people that we care about them by donating quilts and helping others. Just come and join us and have a good time. The United Methodist Women will be collecting dental and personal hygiene packs for the Festival of Sharing. Two gallon bags with a list of items needed for the packs will be available during the month of September in the lobby. Donation packs should be placed back in the cart by the end of September. Thank you. Kids Jam is coming back soon. Kids Jam Children's Ministry will reopen for the fall on Sunday, September 12th. Kids can join us in the Kids Jam room during the 10.30 a.m. service. We'll have some fun, some learning, and a lot of Jesus. Face masks will be required of all children and volunteers as we begin the new year. We look forward to seeing you. Cornerstone Youth Ministry is coming back soon. Youth Ministry will reopen for the fall on September 14th. Students grades 6 through 12 can join us in The Edge on Tuesday nights from 5.30 to 7 p.m. We'll have some fun and some time to learn about our faith. Face masks will be required of all students and volunteers as we begin the new year. We look forward to seeing you there. Monday Ladies Bible Study is back. Join them for Bible Study beginning Monday, September 13th at 10 a.m. This eight-week study will follow the book, The Lord's Prayer, by Douglas Connolly. Books will be available for $7 each. All ladies are welcome. If you would like to participate, please sign up at the bulletin board in the hall across from the office. Jesus teaches it is better to give than to receive. If you would like to give a morning offering today, we have a few options. You may download the Give Plus app through the App Store or Google Play Store by searching for Cornerstone United Methodist Church, O'Fallon, Missouri. You can also give through our website by clicking the Give Online tab, our Vanco Electronic Giving, Online Banking, In-Person Offering Box, or by sending your check to Cornerstone through the U.S. Postal Service. Thank you for your generosity. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here with us on this Sunday. This first song that we have prepared is one that's so much fun, so I invite you to please stand if you are able to. Let's get on our feet and let's clap our hands and spread some joy and love this morning.
waiting in a quiet place, longing for embrace. Lord, I look to you and you're faithful to reveal your heart from the very start. I was meant for you. Oh, I am waiting in a quiet place, longing for embrace. Lord, I look to you, and you're faithful to reveal your heart. From the very start, I was meant for you. Lift up your voice. You've opened up the heavens, and you rain down your love. Father, my heart is toward you. You're my plan enough. Oh, I am resting in your love for me. Open up, receive. Lord, I look to you. And your water it washes over me. For eternity, I was meant to breathe. You've opened up the heavens. You ran down your love, oh, oh, Father, my heart is toward you. You're my pen enough, oh, 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 oh. You're my pen enough, oh. Hold my world inside your hands. Lift up your hands. You've opened up the heavens. And you ran down your love. Father, my heart is toward you. And you're my pen enough. Opened up the heavens. Ooh, you ran down your love. Oh, Father, my heart is toward you. You're my penny now. Oh, you've opened up the heavens. Ooh, you ran down your Father, my heart is toward you. You more than enough. Let's fill this room. You've opened up the heavens. And you ran down your love. Whoa. Father, my heart is toward you. And you more than enough. All right, let's give it up to God. Okay, so this next one is called Build My Life. And the basis of this song is just that God is always our foundation. So anything that you might be struggling with, you can always give it up to God. That's why we come to church on Sundays. That's why we praise and lift up his word and his voice throughout the week, just to become a little bit closer to him. So think about that whenever we sing this song together, and please lift your voice and continue to fill this room.
could ever see Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you struggles, all of our challenges, and give it up to God. Let's do this. Let's just let everything be. Let it be. God will take over. He will serve our life. He will serve you, and he will guide you in the right direction. He is our foundation, and that's what these words are about. So let's sing them together. voice right now. Build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation and I will put my 
trust in you alone and I will not be shaken holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken and I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and I will put my trust Holy and awesome God, we come to you. There's absolutely no one like you. We just thank you for your love. We thank you for the name that's full of grace, offers us truth, the one that provided yesterday, the one that will continue to provide for today and tomorrow. We give you praise for all that you do in our life, as well as the life of this church. We ask that you watch over those going to back to work, the kids that are going back to school, watch over them. Help us to see your Holy Spirit today as we hear your holy message. And it's in Jesus' name we pray all these things and all God's people said. Amen. Go and have a seat. Amen. Help me thank our praise team for leading us in worship today. Oh, thank you. Well, welcome to Cornerstone. I'm Mike Gillen, pastor here at Cornerstone United Methodist Church, whether you're in the sanctuary or online. Grateful to be able to be in worship with you today. I tell you, it was inspiring to me to have the kind of artistry, the kind of dedication to God demonstrated through the singing and instrumental offerings that were brought to us today. I was, I'm standing just uh, off the stage and have to remind myself, I have something I have to do. I can't just be in that stage over there to the side, just being filled up by the tr- tremendous leadership our praise team brought to us in worship today. There's something I have to do. And it's easy to get caught up in something and wait, there's something else. This morning, our scripture speaks to us about how we are called to live for Christ each day and paints a picture that reshapes the way we see ourselves, our place in the world, and our place before God. Hear these words of life in Romans 12 meant for us today. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. 
If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's encourage, then to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, then do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is a continuation of the message series titled Living Better by Faith. Each week we're looking at the ways that Christianity aims for us to live better by faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, Christian faith is meant to be practical. Certainly it it leads us to eternity and to eternal life, but that eternal life begins today with one foot firmly planted in this world. We're meant to be changed in the way we, we live, and that change starts with internal changes in our heart and in our mind with what we value and what we think. Today I want to talk about trusting a crazy community. We discover our identity as we encounter and live with connected to followers of Christ. We call that crazy community the church. Why is it a crazy community? Because we actually believe we are the body of Christ in this world, the hands and feet of Christ. And in order for us to grow in faith, we have to trust that we're meant to be a part of this eternal, international, multi-historic, generational community called the church. Followers of Christ are brought together with one another to form the body of Christ, which is the church. This is how we should start this morning together because this is how Christ wants us to understand who we are, what we're meant to be. The idea that we are the, quote, body of Christ is is not just something to be placed in quotes, but is also a way for us to understand our actual function in this world. We are part of the representation of Christ today. Christ no longer here in physical form except through those who follow Christ. Again, the scripture says to us today, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Have you ever had a part of your body that you wish you didn't have? Because it was giving you some trouble? Or have you had a part of your body that you've forgotten about? And that reminds you, hey, I'm here. Have you had a part of your body that you used to love? And then it went away? The imagery that the Bible gives to us in Romans 12 about what it means to follow Christ is an image that connects to what we really understand so well because we live this world as embodied creatures. If nothing else, the scripture is more true today than ever as the Bible explains to us that this body is us. It really is who we are. The scripture speaks often of how our physical bodies are the gift of God, the grace given to us in this life. And it's not just something imaginary. This is us. And how we live affects who we're meant to be. The scripture for this morning then helps us to understand that in order for the world to see Christ, the followers of Christ form the physical presence of Christ in this world. We are the representatives of Christ to all the world. We're a visible embodiment of the invisible Christ. Through the Spirit, we make the Word of God come alive. On our own, each of us is only a singular part of the body of Christ, but, but we don't exist apart from one another. We need each other in order for our lives and our faith to make sense. And we have to understand each human being is created by God to be part of the body of Christ. Think about all those members of the body of Christ that are not fully connected to who they're meant to be, not fully involved in the work, the purposes, the will of God. Being the hands and feet of Christ means offering ourselves as a living sacrifice for God's eternal work in the world. There are a lot of different ways to try and sum up what it means to accept Jesus Christ, to be part of God's eternal work, to believe in the Christian faith. There are a lot of ways to explain what Christianity is about. 
For some people, Christianity is really eternal fire insurance. How do I avoid an eternity separated from God and an eternity in which fire might be all there is? For some, following Christ is just simply a ticket to heaven. For others, Christianity is some kind of metaphor for how to live life. It's not so much an actual reality as much as it is a nice story that we connect to. I want to suggest to you something in the middle, where we certainly are called to believe in Jesus Christ in order to receive an eternal salvation, but we have to understand that salvation is only real if we live it, that this world is real, that our part to play in this world is real, and that we're called literally to be the hands and feet of Christ in this world as we imitate Christ's life, death, and resurrection. It's not an accident that the Christian church has chosen as her central symbol, the cross. It's not meant to be a nice ornamentation alone. It's meant to remind us that Christ's sacrifice is our own. And here in Romans 12, the stage is set for understand who Christ wants us to be based on Christ's sacrifice and then the call for us to imitate him. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy... That mercy, by the way, is sending Christ to us who gives himself up for us. In view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. In some ways, these words are a little bit lost on us because we don't live in a world like the ones that the ancient Christians lived in. In the time when Romans 12 was written, it was common to see sacrifices on altars during worship rituals, both Christian and pagan. Not Christian, but other, other religions that Christians came from. So there would be physical sacrifices that people would have seen, maybe even grown up in other religions practicing. You know, those sacrifices would be placed on an altar, and a fire would often be used to burn up the sacrifice. The Old Testament speaks about these kinds of offerings made in order to appease God, to seek God's pleasure and grace, and also to pledge support to God. The notion of offering something on an altar and burning that thing up, giving it completely, is the nature of a sacrifice. A sacrifice does not choose to be only partially offered. Once it's on the altar, it's going to be used for its purpose. So the, the language here in Romans 12 is kind of lost on us, especially 21st century American Christians who have probably never been in the presence of a, a ritual in a, in a religion that actually practiced a sacrifice where something is burnt on an altar. But this is the imagery for us today. It connects to the imagery of Christ on a cross, giving himself completely up for us we are called to understand that worship is more than just something done in a, in a sacred room set aside on a specific day to worship God, but worship is an ongoing verbal activity. We verbally speak we are going to worship God, and then we live as verbs. We act out our faith by worshiping God, and our true acts of worship are living as sacrifices. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. What the scripture is trying to explain to us here is that, that these bodies are us. Gifts of God given for good purposes. So we should live better by faith. Give ourselves completely up to God. There are some problems with being a living sacrifice. Like for example, sometimes being a sacrifice is not fun. Because we don't get to serve ourselves, but whatever we're being sacrificed for. Sometimes the language of the 21st century church is completely disconnected from Romans 12. I've been convicted that in my 20, almost, seven, 20, almost 27 years of ministry, that my generation of pastors and the one that preceded mine, that for two generations, American pastors have been shaping churches around what the, the needs of the congregation are. How can we meet their needs? Sometimes we say this, how can we make sure we're feeding our congregation? I hear this often from both pastors and from church members, not, just, not necessarily church members at Cornerstone, but Christians. 
both pastors and Christians will say, we need to be fed. Give me more of what satisfies me. Meet my needs. It's an interesting notion for worship and service in the church. It just doesn't have any connection to the Bible as far as I can tell. What we're taught is, and the scripture is, that when Christ gives himself up for us, he gives us more than we know we have. And then we're called to give that back in service to God. So rather than always seeking to be fed and for our needs to be met, we are called to be serving God and saying, God, how can I serve others being the hands and feet of Christ? It's a difficult thing being a living sacrifice. It's not natural to us. In fact, I'd say to you this, for the vast majority of us, the idea of sacrificing for God means let's make sure we give one hour every so often to God. Here, God calls for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, our entire lives, from birth until our last breath. And to understand, as part of the family of God, brothers and sisters, we're also the body of Christ in this world. Living better by faith requires a change of mind A renewing of thought and belief which transforms attitudes and the way one lives. Christian faith is meant to claim every part of who we are. If you watched the Cardinals game yesterday, we're in St. Louis, by the way, if you're watching us online. If you watched the Cardinals game yesterday, your your faith was tested. As you said to yourself again, Lord, why are you putting us through this torturous experience? Life will test us, test our resolve, test to see what matters most to us. Christian faith calls us to a kind of life where we are being transformed in our mind. We are changed in our attitudes. We look differently at our place in the world. We don't live and die by a momentary victory or defeat. The scripture says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here, the ancient language speaks about this kind of repentance, where uh, it is literally a change of mind. As we give ourselves over to Jesus Christ, we are taught to think differently, which means we look at the world differently. We imagine ourselves in the world differently, and as our mind thinks differently, we act different. And as we act different, we take on new patterns of behavior and speech, and that reinforces and continues the process of us thinking differently. Renewing our minds means that we give our attitudes over to God, our wishes over to God. We take whatever we value and we say, God, you tell us what we should value. We become subservient to God's good purposes. Being subservient is not an easy thing to do. It's difficult. There are places in the Bible where it says, submit yourself one to another in Christ. Usually what happens then is we read into that scripture, well, you should submit to me as we talk to one another about what it means to be involved in the ongoing work of Christ. But here, Romans 12 is clear. Each of us who says yes to God and agrees to follow Christ, each of us is called to be in the same place before God, and that is on our knees, allowing God to reshape how we think about ourselves in this world. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. The pattern of this world is much different than Christ's. The pattern of this world is to look at the world and say, how can I succeed How can I profit? How can I gain? How can I be the winner when someone else is a loser? And here, Christ says to us, follow my lead and give yourself completely over. Change how you see success. As we participate in our spiritual renewal, we discover what God's good purposes are for us. So there is this active part we play 
each of us, in growing in faith and living better by faith, we have to say to God, I want to be the person you want me to be. Help me to understand how to live sacrificially for you, God. How to be a sacrifice for others. How to be part of the body of Christ. Again, the scripture says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. There are kids going back to school tomorrow. I have a child in college and a child in high school. They both start school tomorrow. They don't like tests. But see, they're only used to tests that are given to them. The Bible talks about tests that we administer ourselves. That's very different, by the way. I remember one time our bishop came to church here. He was unannounced. I didn't know he was going to show up. I just saw him walking right through the lobby, looking right at me. I was standing right by our, our lobby. is a large area here at Cornerstone, and at one end is the entrance. The other end is a, an office, and then entrances to the sanctuary. And I was standing by the office entrance watching our bishop walk right to me. Hello, Bishop. How are you? Good. Just want to come worship at Cornerstone. Oh, great. Yeah, thanks. Things went well at church. After church, I'm greeting people as they leave, and he walks behind me. And he pats me on his shoulder, says, good job. I said, did I pass the test? And as he's walking out the door, he looks over his shoulder and said, it wasn't a test. I said, Pat, Bishop, it is always a test. Every time the bishop shows up on Sunday morning, it's a test for me. But every day, I meant every day is a test. Both God seeing what we're willing to do, but also we learning how to test what is the right way to go, what the right attitudes are to have, what the right behaviors are, what the right next step is in life. We test out our decisions all the time. We listen to what we say and think about who we're related to in friendships and love and how we care for those we're biologically related to as well. We are constantly testing what the next step should be for us. The Bible says here that God is actively involved in our life, that the Spirit of God helps us to discern what the next step should be, which path to take. How to live better by faith. As we grow in this act of being living sacrifices, we discover who we're meant to be. How do you discern between good decisions and bad? I think about our children going back to school. In the nine o'clock service, we had kindergarten, first grade, fourth grade, senior in high school all in the same room. They're all going to be learning how to figure out what's the right thing to do and what's the wrong thing to do. God wishes to be involved in this by saying to us, as we value serving others, imitating Christ's service for us, as we understand ourselves as the hands and feet of Christ, it changes what we see as most important. It changes how we want to talk to people. It reminds us that people all around us are also meant to be part of the family of God, the eternal kingdom of God, the body of Christ. As we allow our minds to be renewed, our lives transformed, as we submit ourselves to Christ's way and offer our bodies as living sacrifices to God's will, we will learn how to live for God. Christ followers discover who we are and what we're created to do, do and be as God renews our souls little by little, leading us along the way. Again, the scripture explains to us what this looks like to have our, our very essence renewed, saying this, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. The other day I was uh, driving down this road from my house, going out to Highway 364, which is a highway here in Missouri. 
It's a two-lane road leading from the neighborhood I live in to, to the highway. So one lane going one way, one the other. There are times when on that road, the speed limit is 35, but there are times when people choose to drive slower than the speed limit. And I get caught behind them. And I realize in those moments how connected we are to each other even when we don't realize it. And I have to decide how close will I let the person in front of me know we're connected to each other. (laughs) And then there are other times when I'm starting to feel like, and you know, I'm getting older, and sometimes I feel like an older man as I'm driving down the road, less in a hurry, maybe a little achy at times, you know, not wanting to push my car so much. And I find myself, maybe I'm tired, I find myself driving less than 35. And someone behind me, some young kid, in a car that I, has a really dark windshield, I can barely even see him, gets right up on my bumper. And I remember what it's like to be a young, young guy, how I wanted to push it all the time. And I'm reminded that we're always connected to each other. Have you ever been in a car and you come to a stoplight and you look to your right and there's someone singing like they're in the opera? I mean, like they're, you get, the windows are rolled up and you think to yourself, I bet they can't really sing. I'm glad the windows are up. Some of you can sing. I mean, not everybody sings like Brandon, Karina, and, and, uh, and Sharon are in our praise team, you know. But, or if someone's playing the drums like they're, you know, Dan Spittler, our, our drummer here, or you, you see them playing like they're, have you seen it like they're doing, like they're playing the whole band sometimes in the, They think they're in a bubble that nobody can see them. Have you ever done that? Caught yourself? You didn't realize, oh, people can actually see me in this car. The lesson is we're we're not actually in a bubble in life. Sometimes we think that we are rugged individuals, whether it's we're talking about our faith or just in our life, and that what we do has no effect on other people. Sometimes we think because we can make decisions for ourselves, it means we don't need to consider other people. You know, in the society we live in, we require a kind of social contract where we are caring for each other as others care for us. That our decisions affect others, whether it's driving down the road at a certain speed or it's taking care of one another and kinds of needs that are there. In the scripture for today, the scripture reminds us that we are actually created never to be in a bubble. That we're always in connection to God and to others. And that as we, through faith, find formal connections with other Christians, joining together in this, this ongoing effort to grow in faith, that's when we discover who we are. We aren't individuals living this life, but we are part of the body of Christ, each having important purposes. That's when we discover who we're created to be, when we realize we've never been in a bubble in this world. We've never been isolated in our cars. Our cars are never isolated from others. We are called to understand ourselves as being part of a community of believers that in a crazy way believes they actually embody Christ in this world. This spiritual transformation God wishes to do in each of us requires us to be part of this eternal family, the church. There is something about being a part of a a church family that has a benefit. So for us already in the church, it's a reminder that we're not all God has involved, or God all has in mind when God thinks about the church and the work of the world and who Christ is giving his life for. We, we live in a world where there are people all around us who need to be part of the family of God, the, the crazy trusting community of faith that trusts in Jesus Christ. We're called to bring others in because they need this same family that we need. They need this same connection to the body of Christ that we need. And this is a unique and interesting community to be part of, an eternal community, because everybody gets to play a part. 
Again, the scripture says we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. In other words, God gives us gracious gifts, not just the gift of breath and life, but a place in the world. And at different times, we can play different parts and have different functions, different purposes. The fifth grade Mike Gillen had a different part to play than the senior in high school Mike Gillen or the junior in college Mike Gillen or the 51-year-old Mike Gillen. God gives us gifts and calls us to use those gifts in, as a living sacrifice for Christ. Finding our place in this world means trusting this crazy community of faith that becomes the embodiment of Christ. It's difficult to trust being part of what we're doing here. But it's important. Important to know what we can do and what we can be and who we're meant to be. Again, the scripture says, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy. That word in the ancient language means to preach, right? I think my dad thought he was a preacher. Every, every week I got a sermon. Um, especially when I broke something at the house. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about the kind of revealing what God is doing, usually related to some kind of interaction with what's happening in the world. goes on to say, you know, if, if your gift is service, then go out and serve others. If you're a teacher, teach for God. It goes on. It's an early attempt to try and explain to the people of God, the the, the Christian church, how everybody can find a place of service, of ministry, of purpose in this world through, through faith. I'm amazed at how often I run into people at different stages of life who don't understand how important they are. I think what stands out to me right now is those, those people starting school, those kids starting school, they're with other people all around them who are valuable to God. And I hope we've taught our kids to demonstrate the love of God to their friends at school. I think about people who are moving from childhood to adulthood and beginning to understand that whatever part they end up playing in the world is valuable to God, is God-given in some way. I think about the, the person who's moving into retirement, wondering, is there still a purpose for me? So often I'll have people who are grandparents or great-grandparents speak to me and say, I just don't feel that important. And I have to say, I think we've all missed the primary roles we play. No matter what age we're in, no matter what stage in life we're in, we all are connected to others who love and care for us. I think about those great-grandparents, what an important role they play in their families. For each of us, being the body of Christ means realizing we matter to God. We've been gifted by God to, to be the hands and feet of Christ in this world. And we should trust that God will give us enough to do great things with others and for others. So what should you do this week? How can you not only trust this crazy community that is the church, described as the hands and feet of Christ, but how can you go out and live better by faith? I want to challenge you this week to renew your membership in the family of God. Offer yourself to God daily as a humble and faithful servant. Envision yourself as a crucial part of the body of Christ. Now, there's lots of different roles we can play. God will confirm in you, your role is valuable, eternally speaking. And then this week, pray that God will help you to see how your unique gifts are meant to be part of the work God is doing in the church. Take your place in the body of Christ. You know, folks are both here in the sanctuary and online, 
And it's easy to not think you're that important, whether you're here in person or maybe in a different state uh, around the country. Know this, that you are part of the body of Christ and what you do is important to God. I think about how the church tries to emphasize how important we are at each stage of life and how God works to bring us into this eternal family, into this, this ongoing work of God through the act of baptism, the sacrament of baptism. It's a way for us to see that we are called to live better by faith. Recently, last Sunday after the 1030 service, I had a baptismal service for a seven-month-old named Mackenzie Harris, uh, Eric and Courtney Harris's daughter. The Harris family had relatives who were um, older and also have some health issues, and so they wanted to have a private service where they weren't exposed to a lot of people. But we videoed the service so that the entire church could celebrate this baptism. The reason we baptize people at any age is because we see God's grace working and understand that baptism is a grace given to us, both initiating us into the church, but also confirming our important part in the body of Christ. So I want you to to join me in watching uh, this baptism with with Mackenzie, and we'll celebrate together what God is doing in the Harris family. Hi, I'm Mike Gillen here at Cornerstone United Methodist Church, and it's my privilege and honor to be able to celebrate the baptism of Mackenzie Ann Harris. I'm with <laughs> there she is. <laughs> I'm with Eric and Courtney, her her yeah. dad and mom, and Maverick is her two year old brother who may <laughs> emerge here at different times. And then Bailey Shore and Peyton Harris are the the godparents along with us as well. So this is exciting to be able to celebrate here at Cornerstone this seven-month-old, almost eight-month-old, and welcoming her into God's church today. So we've got some things we'll say together and then a baptism to perform. So God's brought us here for this moment. Let's enjoy it together. Through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated to Christ's holy church and incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation. As such, baptism is an expression of God's grace offered to us without price. Eric and Courtney, you've brought Mackenzie here today to say you are raising her up to know God and to be part of God's church. And so today, I invite you to join me in these baptismal vows. Eric and Courtney, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? I do. I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression? I I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord. I do. We nurtured this child in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself and to profess her faith openly and to lead a Christian life. We will. We will. Amen. So I'm going to speak on behalf of Cornerstone United Methodist Church. Normally they'd be here with us today, but we're making this video during this pandemic so that family and friends are safe uh, during this during this sacrament. So I'll speak on behalf of Cornerstone. On behalf of Cornerstone United Methodist Church, we the church reaffirm both our rejection of sin and our commitment to Christ. We will nurture one another in the Christian faith and in the Christian life and include Mackenzie now before us in our care. With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround her with a community of love and forgiveness that she may grow in her trust of God and be found faithful in her service to others. We will pray for Mackenzie that she may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. The central symbol of baptism is water. Water has a rich history and important meaning in Scripture. It reminds us that God both sustains us, washes us clean from all that keeps us from God, and leads us to the lives we're meant to have. Join me in a prayer together. Eternal Father, pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and this one who will receive it, to wash away her tendency to sin, to clothe her in righteousness throughout her life, that dying and being raised with Christ, she may share in Christ's final victory. Amen. Amen.
What name is given to this child? Mackenzie Ann Harris. Mackenzie Ann Harris. I wonder if you're going to let me hold you for this part. <laughs> Let's find out. Let's see what happens. <laughs> I baptize you, Mackenzie Ann, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Mackenzie, you did great. <laughs> the Holy Spirit worked within you, Mackenzie. <laughs> that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's great. Hey, I like Yay. that. Oh, he's the yeah. You know, through baptism, Mackenzie, you're incorporated into Christ's holy church. By the power of the Holy Spirit. You're part of God's new creation. You're made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. You have been so good. We'll say we can be back to mom now. <laughs> <laughs> Mackenzie, we're all one in Jesus Christ. And we're grateful. And we're filled with joy and thanksgiving that we're able to welcome you into the family of Christ and Cornerstone United Methodist Church. Members of the household of God, I commend Mackenzie to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase her faith, confirm her hope, and perfect her in love. On behalf of Cornerstone, we give thanks to God for all that God has already given you. We welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. That in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Now may the God of all grace, who called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. That was wonderful. It's a beautiful little girl, a great family. The Harris did a great job of raising Maverick and Mackenzie. I'm grateful that we can be a part of their life together in Christ and look forward to the ways God will work through them. I know that you brought joys and concerns with you this morning. Let me invite you to, to pray with God silently as I lead us in a prayer. We've mentioned a number of people we're praying for. Also, I want to add uh, Dale, who was uh, admitted in the hospital on Friday, still there. We're praying for Dale as well. So join me in prayer. God, what a good thing it is to be able to see you at work. We can see at every stage in life you, you reaching out to us and inviting us to grow in faith. We're excited about the new life that's in McKenzie and see that new birth can be part of our lives too. This week, God, remind us to look for you, to aim to be your hands and feet in this world. And as we pray this week, God, remind us of those people we lift up to you and seek your grace for and mercy for. And for us, God, help us to see just how important we are to you and how each day you have something you want to do in us and through us. Now, God, remind us of what it means to be your people. Teach us to pray as we remember your son's prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we have one more song to sing. Let's stand together or at home, let's join together in our final song. It's a great day of worship. Let's sing about how God, how great God is to each and every one of us today. You are good, you are good, when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in, you 
are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace, when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, in you death is lost its sting. And I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your the world forever You are more, you are more than my words will ever sing You are Lord, you are Lord All creation will proclaim You are here, you are here In your presence I'm made whole You are God, you are God today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Take that this week and remember that God loves you and be the light of the world and show others that light that may not know the name of Jesus.